This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Okay, hi ladies and gentlemen. I want to introduce you to my old, very dear friend. I knew this man when he was in high school. We used to improvise together. Uh, since then, a few important things have happened. He wrote um, something called Homer's Odyssey. Does it snap a fun fact? Anybody, does the words Homer's and Odyssey mean anything to you? This one, tell me. The first episode of The Simpsons ever turned in, <coughs> ever. And we're gonna look at a little bit of it and we're gonna talk about that. He's written 100 episodes of The Simpsons, 100 more of Frasier, uh, Malcolm in the Middle, Wendell and Vinny, his own show on Nickelodeon, which was last year and fantastic. Um, and now is, has just commenced working on the long-awaited new Nickelodeon series, School of Rock. Um, Jay Kogan was born into a comedy family. Hmm. He is a consummate comedian, improviser, comic writer and producer and director. You've done improv and stand-up. Um, you started a very important page in the comic history of the internet called The Stump, <laughs> which my husband I don't know how and important almost, it was. I think, well, <laughs> it was important to a lot of people for a lot of hours when they should have been yes. working. Um, you have won four primetime Emmys, had another seven nominations. If I'm getting any of this wrong, feel free to correct me. I won't correct you. Humanitas, <laughs> uh, the Writers Guild Award, the U.S. Comedy Arts Festival for your film, The Wrong Guy. You have been script doctor on almost all the Mike Myers films that we loved and one that we might have been about. <laughs> right. um, and also worked uh, on The Nutty Professor, on Chris Rocks. You've been an on-set writer. You've done a billion things. None I'm too we, good to be here. You are too good to be here, yeah. <laughs> except you're here. Okay. Please welcome Jay Kogan. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. What are all you people doing here on a Friday? <laughs> this is weird. Bad planning, guys. This is, this, this is what we call pre-partying. Okay. Right? <laughs> this is how we do it, right? <laughs> so, okay. Let's start at the very beginning and then move our way forward, okay? Okay. Way back machine, young Jay, you've had a life in TV, what are your early fond TV memories? My earliest memory of actually seeing a TV show made? <laughs> okay, okay my, sure, oh. made and watch, and watching. Okay, well watched, I, don't know. I, I remember there used to be a show, watching, there used to be a show when I was a little kid called Winky Dink. And Winky Dink was a cartoon, and somewhere in the middle of the cartoon, they would ask you to help Winky Dink get over a bridge by drawing it on a magic screen. It's like Dora the Explorer kind of does the same thing. Um, and and uh, I didn't have the magic screen. I just had a crayon. And I used to draw on the TV <laughs> the thing, and my mom and dad would be very upset at me. So I remember that because I got in trouble. That was my first memory. Excellent. But the first time I ever was on a, a set of a TV show that I remember was a show called The Dean Martin Show. These people, how many people remember or have ever heard of Dean Martin as a singer? Some of you, that's Good great. Class. That's That's impressive. Anyway, Dean Martin, great singer. If you've ever thought of hearing what cool singers in the 50s sounded like, he, you should yeah, check him like out. the original Ocean's Eleven. Right, he was a Frank Sinatra kind of Rat Pack guy. Anyway, he had his own TV show, and his TV show is unlike anything you guys have ever seen. It would blow you away now. It, would, it blows me away. I saw it recently, but holy who does that? He, can't, he walks in, he wears a tuxedo, he doesn't rehearse his show, it's completely written, he reads everything off in cue cards, and he sort of stumbles through his whole show as, it, as he's drinking scotch, and then goes home. Uh, and it's not horrible, it's charming. It sounds like a recipe for the worst show on, on TV. It's kind of SNL, yeah, with a tuxedo. It was great. Anyway, I, my dad was a writer on this show, and they had a Christmas episode, and they had kids, they wanted kids to be around 
uh, uh, Dean Martin and Dennis Weaver, who was an actor at the time, they were gonna sing a Christmas song to kids. So I was one of the kids, so I was there for two days, and I thought, this is great. What a great way to make a living. This is what my dad does all day. He sits and plays, and I, and I really was like impressed at five years old, like this is, you could make a living playing and singing and doing stuff. Playing it's a, with your friends. Yeah, it seemed like a great idea. So I remember that. Okay, so that so so the the seed got planted early on that gosh you can grow up and play. Yeah, I mean I think most kids who are on the set of a TV show almost all, universally leave saying why aren't I working on that show? <laughs> like especially a kid show. I was on a, on the set of The Partridge Family. That's another show that you guys don't know. But I was on the set of Partridge Family when I was twelve, and it's about kids who sing at a bus or something like. And I, I had no I have no singing talent, and no, but I left thinking, why aren't I on that show? It's like, well, I've done nothing. I never studied acting, I never auditioned. There's no reason for me to be on that show, but I was jealous. I wanted to be on The Partridge Family. It's just a magical time yeah. when you think you can do anything yeah. that you cannot do. Yeah, kids are dumb. Right. Yeah. We know that. Mm -hmm. um, so when did it first dawn on you that you could, that n n not only can you do this, but you actually could do this? Like, was there, was there a moment where you went, can oh, I? That's, I, yeah, I, I think you're going to be okay. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still not sure. I think it's going to work out. Okay. I mean, do, do, do what? Do, like, like I tried, like, I, when I first met you, I was trying to be an actor. Okay. And a stand-up comedian. How old were you? You were like 16, 16. 17. Okay. You're 16 years old. You go to high school. Yeah. And you find your way to a group of adults. Where were we? On Hollywood Boulevard or Sunset Boulevard? Off Sunset Boulevard, we're yeah. We're on Sunset Boulevard in a little basement theater under a 7-Eleven mm -hmm. doing improv. How did you get there? Uh, well, I was turning tricks on Sunset Boulevard, and oh, I just thought, right. well, how I easy, I'll come in from the cold. No, uh, I, I think what happened was Bill Steinkellner, one of the great improv teachers of all time. Why, he teaches here at UCSB. Uh, there you go. He's there. Uh, was one of my very first, if not my very first, Groundlings teacher, which I took the Groundlings before I was in in Billy's class at the Gardner stage. Oh, did you take a teen class for the Groundlings? No, a, just I didn't have teen classes, I just took a class. Okay. And so I was fairly young, taking that class, loved it, and then I took a, a, another class with Phyllis Katz, I don't know who taught who first, but it one of, and then um, they wanted me to wait before I went to the advanced. They thought I was too young. So they put me on hold. Because you were 15. Yeah. So I put me on hold, and I said, well, I really like doing this. And then Bill had, Billy had a, a, his own class, and he was gracious enough to let me come, even though I probably didn't deserve to come, because all the people in that class were so good. Uh, and, I, and I loved it. But it's, it's, it's a theme that we've been starting to develop in this class, the idea that even at an early age, you find something that you love, and even if you're too young to do it, even if you're not going to get paid to do it, even if you can't do it, you do it because you love it, right? That's fun. I mean, I was, yeah, I loved it. It was fun. Nobody was going to tell me not like I, tell me not to do that if I could. You know, I, that was a really fun thing to do. I got great satisfaction out of the whole experience. I want to be. I knew at some point I had hopes and dreams of being a, a writer director, and I knew that was going to be good for that. I had been trying my hand at stand up comedy, that was going to be good for that. If I wanted to be an actor, that was good for that. If I just wanted to sort of come out of my shell in high school, that was good for that. There was a lot of pluses for that kind of class. So it was fun. And I just have to ask, logistically, how were you getting there? Did you have a driver's license in I did. the car? I had oh, a driver's okay. license. Okay, By the time I was 16, I had a driver's license. The day I turned 16, I had a driver's okay. license. But before then, at the Groundlings, I think I was getting some rides. OK. OK. So you, so you not only have this desire and this will and this kind of chutzpah to make it happen, even though you're very much younger than everybody else, but you've got support. Yeah, but I used to go to the Groundling show and see the Groundling show and think that was really awesome. By the time when I was 12 and 13, I would go all the time to right. the Groundling show, or I would go to the improv or the comedy store and see comedians. They let little kids in for some reason. I don't know why. It was a bar. But right. they let you in, and I would watch really great comics uh, blow the roof off the place. And I said, this is awesome. How great are these people? So it made me want to do something in that world. And just to define a couple of terms, do we, guys, do we know who the Groundlings are? And the Groundlings is an improv comedy theater and troupe down do they, in... Do you guys know what UCB is? Upright Citizens Upright Brigade? Upright Citizens Brigade? No. The okay. Amy Poehler right. comes, and, and a lot of the uh, community and, and Parks and Rec people come right. out of UCB. Groundlings is, is, has fed a lot of Saturday Night Live, Melissa right. McCarthy and, and Will Ferrell and, and 
A lot of the comics that you see are coming out of the improv tradition. Right, Second City, I guess, was the granddaddy of them all, and and then a lot of offshoots of Second City was brought you a lot of people who were on Saturday Night Live. Almost all of them from Saturday Night Live were from that some ver some version of that improv background. Right, and so and and the. Some of the benefits of improvisation. Do we know what improvisational theater is? Improvisation. Raise your hand if we, if you've got a, a sense of this. Okay, so let's explain a little bit about what happens in improv. Okay. You, uh, it, much like what we're doing right now, it is unscripted theater. Unlike what we're doing right now, you're playing characters in scenes that the audience often will suggest. Oh, you're two um, flamingos on the moon. And then you have to be that. Right. And you so just your job, can't. your job is to think about um, what it would be to whatever situation you, you're given, and agree that's what you'll do. And two people who are good at this, you have to learn. It's a learned skill, like volleyball or anything else. You have to learn the rules of it. And then the better you get at it, the better the scene will be. The first scenes you do when you're beginning uh, at the school or at the Groundlings or anywhere aren't going to be great, because you're still learning to learn how to commit to be a character, learn how to listen to people when they're talking, learn that you can use the space around you, uh, learn that, that you don't have to make jokes all the time, that you can just sort of be in a scene and the scene will take care of itself. Those, those are things you have to spend time doing, but eventually you learn it. Or you don't. <laughs> Or, or you learn different things. Yeah. But, wait, but one of the things you're learning, you're learning skills uh, like agreement, like going, like figuring out what is, what's the seed of this thing and going along with that, right? Yeah, I mean, if, if there's, if you're a, uh, on, on the moon, you, somebody, sometimes there's improvisations where you say, you call the scene, you, two people are just standing there and we don't know what it is. And one actor says, gosh, I've never been to Mars before. If the guy next to you says, I'm not on Mars, I'm on a pirate ship, your scene's gonna suck. Um, John Lovett said that to me once, <laughs> exactly like that. I said, I'm on Mars, and he said, no, I'm on a pirate ship. Um, <laughs> uh, so, Why the master thespian that and he the, is. And the scene did suck. Uh, but, but yeah, if they agree we're on Mars, then a scene can develop, and we're agreeing about it, but we're also having to add information. Now the next person that's next, to you, next to you says, yes, we're on Mars, and boy, we've been up here for eight years, and I'm getting a little lonely, and yeah. that's a new information. And then, you know, we, well, we better get back to uh, finding the lost colony, of, and then they start digging around and looking, and, and it adds action. And now we're, in, now we're in the land of pretend. Yeah. And that's basically what it is. And it's really fun to pretend. It still is fun to pretend. Yeah, we still have fun pretending. Yeah. You still improvise, I still do yep. it. Um, were you, as you started developing and becoming very successful in the world of comedy writing, how, your dad, who was well established, obviously, um, over many, many, many years, all three are growing up, uh, did he love it? Was he, was he there a like the one I got when I got paid for it, okay. eventually. He was discouraging of me up until the point, that point, because I think that, that um, he chose to leave Brooklyn, New York, and become a, a, a comedy writer, which is like telling your family, I'm going to go and live in an undersea city. Like, they had no clue as to what that means, and they thought my father was crazy. When I told my father, I would like to, I'm gonna try to become an actor and do something, he knew what it was, and he was still scared shitless. Because he says, it's really hard, and you might starve, and that would be bad, and wouldn't you rather be a lawyer? Uh, and uh, I said, no, I want artistic integrity. He says, really think about being a lawyer. <laughs> and so uh, he wanted me to become an agent or a lawyer, something that had a little bit more safety uh, uh, attached to it. And I understand that, because I have a son, and I don't know if I'd want uh, him to j jump into a risky business, or, I mean, I, I, he probably will, but, but, you know, I understand. We well, want to protect our fun. kids. You've taken them to the set and made it look fun. Yes. I that's a problem. That's, that's okay. But we want to protect our kids and give them the best shelter we can. The, um, you went to UCLA, correct? Yeah. Um, Sorry. It's okay. We're all okay. one big UC family. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so, um, did you, did, were you studying film and television? I was, there? and a film major from the, one of the last undergraduate film majors they had at the time, and I hated it. Why? I quit the program. Why, why? They were making, the whole program was designed, and I think was, had started 
become this way in the 1960s, before, <laughs> before I was born, was UCLA was going to be an art school, avant-garde, you know, and, and uh, they're not about narrative stories, they're about pushing the envelope in what you can show and style and interpretation and, and all that kind of stuff. We, we talked about Birdman earlier. So that, it's, it, Birdman has a lot of interpretation to it, which is interesting to some people and other people hate it. But, but that was their mode of, and I liked movies that actually had stories and, and, and characters and that had a beginning and a middle and an end. And they said, oh, well, if you want to do that, you got to go to USC. And I went, oh, <laughs> what a bad idea. You want to tell story. Now you tell me. <laughs> so I, and, and you have to pay for your own films. So you, I would wind up, to get an A, I would have to pay like $35,000 of my own money to create a movie that I hated to get a good grade. And I thought, well, I don't want to do that. So I transferred to a lot of different uh, majors. And eventually I went to English major, and then I didn't like that, and then communications, and I didn't like that, and then psychology, and that was just too hard. And then I landed as a philosophy major, and I stuck with that. Okay. All right. So having had that checkerboard education, mm -hmm. what sticks and makes you the comedy writer that you are now, having been a philosopher, a, a wannabe psychologist, and all those other things? They're all pretty good yeah. in writing characters. They're all pretty helpful in being a writer. Uh, being The philosophy I like the most because it's like being a lawyer. You have to know... You have to look objectively at an argument and be able to argue both sides at any time. I mean, that's why people hate philosophy, because you never get to an answer. You're just a lot of people arguing. Uh, but I was good at that. So I could, I could take a logistical argument and argue both sides of anything and then try to rip it apart or, or build it up. And that, that was fun. And, and that's what we do in the, in the writer's that's room. We take a story and we sort of start building that story and say, does that, does that make logical sense? Does it make psychological sense? Is it fun? Is it, is it surprising? Is it interesting? You know? And, and I, I guess the, of all those five things of, of, uh, of uh, English, uh, you know, uh, film and English and, and uh, Communication. communications and, and f psychology and it, the film was the least I use. Interesting. The least. The most I learned about, um, I learned about film more from watching movies and then making movies than I did from a class about it. So if you were going to suggest one, mm -hmm. if, if we have one elective in the spring that we mm -hmm. can take, what would you say? A philosophy, uh, like a survey philosophy Is there class? a surfing elective? A surfing elective. <laughs> Is there? I would take that. We just do that. I mean, holy we, crap. We just, we just do that anyway. That's, that'd be fun. No, I don't know. I mean, have fun. I mean, none of the school, it doesn't matter, I don't think. <laughs> Sorry. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's a, people who go to film school are kind of wasting their time a little bit um, because there's stuff to be done you can write on your own. You can work on your own. If, as soon as you get a job as a PA getting pizza on a, on a movie or on a TV show, if you ever get that opportunity, you're going to learn more in that six-week period than you will in four years of film school. PA, production assistant. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, that, I started doing that. I was just getting a lot of people sandwiches and, and coffees and what have you. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. So you graduate with a degree in philosophy. No. What? I did not graduate. I'm, awesome. What I'm, happened? I'm four courses away from graduating. Are you going to go back? No. Okay. Well, I might. I, I actually want to beat my son. My son is going to go to college. I would like to get a college degree before he does. Okay. So I'm definitely going to, I only have four courses to do. And do you I'm know actually, what they are? Do you have to take statistics? They're philosophy courses. Oh, okay. And I have to, I've already talked to UCLA about doing them. I just have to do them. But I will do them before, before he does. Can't you just go give a commencement address and get an honorary? No, I asked. <laughs> Believe me, I asked. Uh, and it's hard. I just put, you know, everything's hard at UCLA. Parking is hard. Um, Park, parking's the worst. Yeah. But uh, so, so I did okay. not graduate. So you I, did but, not but graduate. I stopped, what happened instead of I got of a job as a, as a PA on a show called It's Gary Shandling Show. Remember that? They don't remember that. They, I remember, they that. remember the Larry Sanders show, maybe, but they don't remember the It's Gary Shandling show. Gary Shandling's but as a Bernadette, comedian. Bernadette Burkett came in and talked with us. And oh, she okay. Was on that. okay. Yes, so then she going. does remember. Okay. So, anyway, Bernadette was, yeah, it was lovely. So it was last quarter. Okay. 
I got a job to do exactly that. Xerox scripts, deliver them at three in the morning to actors who wouldn't read them. You know, uh, I, uh, you know, get go to Costco and buy giant amounts of beverages and bring them in stock refrigerator and stock paper and all that kind of stuff. And at the same time, I got to see the, how the writers worked. I was the writer's P PA. So I got to be there late hours while they were rewriting. I could read the scripts that they were writing, see the changes they were making, go down on stage and watch rehearsal and see how that rehearsal was going and see what each show, how it evolved and changed. It was a real education on how that's done, realizing that, oh my gosh, you have to pay for these sets and you can't write as many sets as you might want to in any show. There's a limit to the amount of characters, the limit to the amount of uh, sets you can have. There's a, uh, there's a limit to the amount of time you can film or shoot or videotape or whatever. The, and and uh, logistics in getting all that done and seeing how post-production works and editing and all that stuff that I thought I knew from, from film school that I learned much uh, more exacting when I actually had to be a part of delivering a, a master tape to a vault and seeing where mm -hmm. that vault goes and, and, and people freaking out like, you don't lose that tape because uh, the whole show's on that. Um, or getting, you know, reading scripts or re seeing how jokes change or seeing how actors won't do jokes the way you thought they would and then producers begging them to do it a different way and them yelling at them, you know, the, all that, the, the whole dynamic of how it all works. I saw from, from working. A, a job that paid nothing. You know, a very bad job, but I got a real education. Yeah, but it was, it was kind of your physics major. It was where you learn about space and time. And, and Right, and it's also you get, we got the chance, my partner and I, uh, I had a writing partner at the time, and uh, he was also my PA partner. I got him, he's my, my, uh, my good high school friend, Wally Walidarski. And so every time I'd get a job, I'd get him the job too. And so we'd go and work together, and at a certain point we said, we could write this stuff. And so we wrote a spec version of that show, it's Gary Shandling's oh, show, okay. while we were there. And then we showed it to the producers, thinking they're going to love this, and they're going to make this, and we're going to be writers. <laughs> and we showed it to them, and they went, eh. Um, but they said, but we saw hope, and we see uh, some potential, so we're going we're gonna to give you a script that you will write, and we will make that show. Really? If you just, you have to hang in for another six months. That was after working there for a year. You must have been very good PAs. I was a shitty PA. Really? But I was, I was funny. Okay. I, made, I made them laugh, so that, that helped. But I, um, I used to keep a big sparklets bottle, you know those big giant bottles? of the sparkless water, an empty one. Remember those? Right by the door of the, we, lived, we were working on the second floor of a, of, a, of a studio, and every time I'd go out the door, I would throw the bottle down the stairs and make the sound of somebody falling down the stairs. <laughs> and they loved it the first time. <laughs> they liked it the second time. They, by the 10th time, they hated it. By the 40th time, they loved it again. So it's like, yeah, I had to stick with it. And eventually, I got like standing ovations for doing it. Is that a trick of comedy? It's just like the commitment yes. to stick with it? Yes, it is, absolutely. If you stick with something long enough, you know, you, Kathy Griffin can have a career. I... <laughs> this is being taped, right? Right. Okay, yeah, that's all right. Hi, Kathy. Yeah. Um, uh, the, but, but that's true, because I bet what happens is you refined the element of surprise because they think, oh, he can't possibly do that again. And so then it really is a surprise that you actually I, would do that again. Maybe it's a surprise. I just think it's like the guts of like, really, is he going to do it again? <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, there's a combination of it, but, but it, def it definitely gets unfun. You have, to, you have to brave the part where people hate you. <laughs> and if you're willing to do that. But, but anyway, we, we, they said, you can write a script. And we said, great. So we hung out for another six months. And they never gave us that story. And they never let us write oh. that script. And we wrote a second spec script anyway, saying, do this. It's even better. And they read that one and said, we love this one. We're still not going to do it. Uh, and then we showed that script to another producer who worked on its Gary Shandling show called Sam Simon. And Sam Simon read it, and he liked it enough to show it to Jim Brooks and Heidi Perlman and Jerry Belson, and he worked on a show called The Tracy Ullman Show. And they said, I have found two mediocre but very cheap writers. We should give them a sketch. And then we came in and pitched a sketch. They let us write one, and they said, OK, this is a decent sketch, and you cost nothing, so welcome aboard. <laughs> yes, okay. And then, so they hired us. 
uh, and, and as a uh, staff writers, and we started writing there. Okay. So this, this is interesting, now the plot thickens. Because mm -hmm. this is the Tracy Ullman Show, you've been hired on your very first gig at like the lowest possible pay scale. Right. And what happens next? We worked and we wrote more sketches than anybody else on that show. We just kept churning them out and churning them out and churning them out, and they would take them and rewrite them, and, th and we sort of made ourselves invaluable, I hope, for the amount of uh, productivity we had. And uh, they kept, they, they raised us up from story editor to, oh, there's all these credits in TV, really, that are kind of bullshitty. Like, if you see watch TV, there's all these credits. And I'm sure people have come here and told you they don't mean anything. They don't. So there's, there's like story editor, executive story editor, uh, co-producer, producer, supervising producer, uh, co-executive producer, executive producer, and they're all just writers. And none of them, except the executive producers, usually there's one executive producer who's the boss, or a team who's the boss, and everybody else just works for those people. Um, and, that, and as labels is just saying, this guy's getting paid shit, this guy's getting paid a little better than shit, this guy's getting good money, and it's like, that's, that's a demarcation. Uh, so yeah, so we worked our way up from, on the Tracy Ullman Show from staff writer, I think, to supervising producers. Okay, so take us to the origins of Homer's Odyssey. So The Simpsons was this cartoon on The Tracy Ullman Show. And The Tracy Ullman Show was this show that, that was a sketch show on Fox. Fox was a brand new network, one of the first shows, and it was a half hour, and we, we wrote sketches. And all the sketches on The Tracy Ullman Show had, I thought, pretty shitty endings. It's one of those, those things where it didn't really end funny. It ended okay, and it was often in a song, which was always, for my generation, really disappointing. Like, really, you're gonna sing a song, that's your out? But uh, of course, I worked there, so I didn't tell that to my bosses. Um, but it was a little disappointing. But the thing that was funny was these little cartoons of The Simpsons. We had uh, interstitial between commercials. They'd show uh, The Simpsons or other cartoons too. But The Simpsons seemed to be very funny. And we show we put a reel together of all the little 30-second Simpsons cartoons, and we should show them to our audience as we were going to tape them. Uh, tape the show, and they would laugh much harder at the little reel of cartoons that we were showing than at the show that we were presenting to them that night. And the geniuses around us said, you know, we should do something with those cartoons. And so uh, uh, Jim Brooks and Sam Simon uh, said, let's make it a, sh Jim Brooks really said, let's make this into a show. He hired Sam Simon and Matt Groening to sort of make the show. And their first call was to us, me and Wally, to sort of help them because we were there. I think you were there and you delivered. Yeah, they knew that you delivered. I guess, and also we were young. We were the youngest people there, and I think Sam wanted young people to be involved. Ah. At the thing. I was 23, so sort of like everybody else was 58. Like it was really like, okay, we want a young sensibility. There, this easy access to young people. So suddenly you were you were representing. A whole audience. I was my my generation. You were you were, yes, you were exactly. letting these guys know what you kids were gonna like. <laughs> exactly, I guess so. So we would walk through a mall, and we'd sit and talk and walk through malls and talk about what Springfield was like and talk about what it should be and what all the the things that that uh, some of which came to pass and some of which didn't come to pass. Ooh, tell us what didn't come to pass. Well, Marge, when at the beginning had a still does has a giant blue hairdo. Matt Greening thought she had rabbit ears inside that blue hairdo. Uh, oh, because he used to do a rabbit cartoon called rabbits. Life with Life in Hell mm -hmm. in the LA Weekly. Turns out we didn't do that. Marge has real ears. But her hair is large enough to accommodate rabbit ears. I think that's why he drew it that way, so that someday we could reveal the rabbit ears. And you were telling me that Bart Simpson had inspiration. Bart Simpson's based on Charlie Brown. He, if you look at Charlie Brown, drawing of Charlie Brown, and you look at picture of Bart Simpson, you'll see his hairline is the same as Charlie Brown's shirt. The zigzag? Uh, zigzag shirt. The way we, we, we Charlie Brown's always shown at a uh, complete 90 degree. You see his nose uh -huh. this way, or his nose this way, or three. You never see him straight on. Right. We, don't, we do the Simpsons, people don't go straight on. Oh, we used, that's We copied the animation style of that show. Uh, everybody's like a big golf, you know, big circle heads, like the Peanuts. So it's, it's a very peanutty looking show. So the original little interstitial pieces that were on the Tracy Ullman show were the family. They were the Simpsons family? Yeah, well what they wanted to do, originally Fox wanted to buy the Life in Hell comic. Okay, and make the bunny those, rabbits. Make, the, make that the interstitial cartoon and 
and Matt Groening said, great, that sounds awesome. And they said, great, you just sell us the rights to all of your forever of the life in hell thing for no, for no money, and then we're in business. Yeah. And then he said, well, I don't want to give you the thing that I'm actually making money on, so I'm going to make something up, something else up. And he drew on a napkin five characters, and he didn't know what it was going to be. He just said, how about this family? And they said, okay. And then it took a while to sort of figure out what, it was, what those characters would be. Where's that napkin? I don't think it exists. I don't know. That should be like a Smithsonian napkin, shouldn't it? Yeah, well, it's, it's certainly worth, you know, billions of dollars to somebody. But uh, anyway, so, so we made, we, we they, Matt Groening and, and a bunch of, uh, David Silverman and Brad Bird and all these people made those little interstitial cartoons. Right. And then that turned into the series. So we were, they, when they decided to make it a series, it completely changed from those little cartoons. The little cartoons, I don't know, has anybody seen the original Tracy Ullman? cartoon things for The Simpsons? No. One person up there. Well, they're two. They're very rudimentary. They're rough and ugly, and Homer doesn't talk the way he, Homer talks now like he's learning disabled. Um, and so he talks, he talks like this, and he's kind of stupid, right? Um, the original Homer talked like Walter Matthau, a little angry and grumpy, and get out of here, kid, you know? And so. Was uh, it still Dan Castellaneta? Yeah. Yeah, just a different voice. Just a different voice. Ah, ah, get out of here. It was running like, you know, W.C. Fields or something. Uh, and uh, Bart also didn't have, the, have a character, and Lisa didn't have a character, and Marge didn't have a character. So over time, we sort of figured out what their characters were. And then, you know, walking through malls, like I say, well, who are these people and what will they be? So you're walking through malls for inspiration? Just because we're kind fat of. and we want to eat. Okay, that's yeah. fair. Uh, so we would go to food court, uh, and and we talk, and and uh, you know, is Matt's idea that Springfield would be a city that has everything that every city in the world has? Uh, Springfield has one of um, Sam Simon's idea about who those characters would be and how they would look, and and the drawings he refined how they looked. Um, but you know, it's a combination of those two guys really doing it, and, and every now and then Wally and I would sort of pipe up and say, well, we could do this, and we could do that, and you know, we could show volcanoes, and whatever. <laughs> Cartoons, it's really freeing to write a cartoon after you've written a sketch show. Sketch show is, you know, you're allowed to build a set and have two actors and a lot of people talking, and, and in a bad song. Uh, in a cartoon, you can do anything and go anywhere and write, you know, even for a quarter of a page. And have really good songs. Yeah, and, but Interior Volcano Day, you know, you can write <laughs> that and actually draw it, you know. Interior Volcano, 10,000 henchmen wait as, that will draw it. So you can write that and it's very freeing. Um, you can't write it for a movie, you can't write it for any other form but a cartoon. So that was kind of fun. When you create a char characters like this, you are then in a proprietary way, paid each time that they appear in an episode, in theory. In theory, in theory it's supposed to work that way. That's but good no, stuff. It, it didn't work that way. Damn. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, a long story that these guys don't want to hear about, but something to do with when, when The Simpsons wasn't a union show. Union, how many people here uh, like unions? None. Okay. Um, my, the Writers Guild happens to be a really good union. And there's a lot of protection for writers in a, in a world that has no protection for anyone. If the show business could, they'd pay you nothing. And, and do sometimes. Uh, yes, and, and when they can, they pay you nothing, and then they sort of rip you off. The, the Writers Guild and Directors Guild and these guilds actually protect you for the minimum, the least that, that they're allowed to pay you. And one of the protections is if you create a character and it takes off, you get a little tiny bit of money for it. Our contracts were tied to the Writers Guild, basic minimum agreement. So everything that was on The Simpsons was connected to that agreement that the, the Writers Guild had with the studios. However, they did not cover animation, so it was sort of just an agreement. And all our contracts said, mm. it's the same, it's exactly the same. At a certain point, the writers on the show wanted the actual union to be, to cover the show. And one of the sacrifices they said was, you, we will not, we will not charge Toy Century Fox for character payments uh, retroactively ah. for characters. Uh, that's what that's what Fox demanded. Fox said, "Fine, you can be a union, but we're not paying for character payments because that would cost us a lot of money to people like Jake Hogan." Yeah. And then, so I didn't get that. Hmm. And so that was a sacrifice 
I feel like I made so that these people could get health benefits and other things. You fell on your sword. You know what? You are a hero. I am. You are a writer's guild hero. You're welcome, people. You're welcome to the future. (laughs) We thank you. (laughs) Um, Have you... Have you ever had something that you just believed in so much and it just failed Everything. completely? Everything I've ever done. Uh, well, yeah, of course. I mean, of course. I mean, it's, yeah, I've, every, I've, I've written so many pilots. And there's not a pilot that I've written. Do you guys know what pilots are? Prototype TV shows? So the, the, Sample, you know, yeah. It's, just a, it's, it's a prototype TV show. It's yeah. like if it comes from a a script, and then you know, first you pitch an idea, and if they like it, they say, we'll pay you to write a script, and then you write the script, and if they like it, they say, we'll, let you, we'll pay you to make the a, a prototype show, and if they like the show, they'll put it on the air. Well, I've done so many versions of pitching shows, writing scripts, making pilots, and then sometimes getting them on the air, and every time, I invest my heart and soul into it. I love the characters, I see the show, I see the future of it, and when it doesn't pan out, which is almost always, I'm a little heartbroken. So, yeah. So, how do you get up and do the next one again after that? Ah, the bills to pay. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so it's practical. It really is practical. I mean, that and, and also like... But then you invest your heart again. Yeah, but I mean, this is the, this is the business. The, who, you have to have passion in what you do, right? I mean, that's the one thing that, that is required. Is you have to have passion. I mean, I guess it's not required, but your life sucks if you don't have it. So the ability, everybody says, but it's true. When you get knocked down, the ability to get back up is the thing that determines whether you're, a, you know a happy person ultimately or an unhappy person. If you stay down, you're an unhappy person. If you get back up, you have hope, right? So I like to have hope. Do you have, I mean, do you have tricks that you, or, or things that help you get back up? Um, tell myself what I just told you, yeah. you guys. You actually uh, tell yourself. Yeah, you have to be, yes, it's yeah. hard. It's hard to, to take a punch in the gut, but things will only get better if you try again. The only way to to get what you want is to try again. And it's true. And I lie to myself about a lot of other things. I don't have to lie to myself about that. No, that's a true thing. Yeah. And alternately, when you're really on a roll, when you're really in the zone, you you did 100 episodes of The Simpsons, and you were flying there. It was a large group of people. It wasn't just me. But it was a community really in sync. Yeah, right? I mean, we, we were in sync, but we had leaders, and we had uh, and agendas, and we had uh, things to do, and it was a 52-week year. There were no breaks, so it was really exhausting, and we were in charge of things that are more than just TV show, like music and editing and shows for the ice capades and comic books and, and all kinds of stuff. There was like a whole ancillary world. You were managing the, the whole brand. Amongst, I, not me, me. The, you all. The whole group, yes. I mean, and, and especially Matt Groening was like handling a lot of the sort of publicity for the show and going on talk shows and dealing with all that kind of stuff. You know, it's a big, it became a big enterprise. And that's interesting because often the thing that could, would compel somebody to become an artist or a writer is not necessarily the same set of skills or even impulses that would have you be a mega businessman, an entrepreneur, and a, and a spokesperson and all those things. Yeah, I mean, that's true. But, but here's the thing. I mean, are all these people want to be writer, director? We all want to be all kinds of things. Okay, we're, we're really from all over campus. Okay, so it doesn't... But if you want to be... Uh, a, a writer or a, you're exactly right. You go into writing because you want to sit in a room and create a little story and give it to somebody and have them make it. But the, 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 the job you learn quickly becomes selling like a salesman, like a vacuum cleaner salesman, selling your idea to people and like, you know, and it's kind of sweaty, edge of your seat, and this is what happens, and this is what happens, and get really excited and, and uh, passionate and try to convince them that they have to do this, and then you have to convince them to keep it on, and you have to convince actors to come work for you, and you have to convince people to sort of change their, you, you have to manage a whole world of people, and that has nothing to do with being a writer. That has everything to do with sort of learning managerial skills and learning sales skills and learning people skills and all that sort of stuff that nobody goes into show business for. 
The, people, the reason people go into show business, generally speaking, is because they want to feel uh, loved somewhere down the line. And this is the worst business for feel loved. It is all rejection, honest to God. It's like 95% rejection. So you go in for, for the love, but you come out with resilience. Hopefully you learn to respect yourself, and you learn that you like the projects you're doing, mm -hmm. and you learn that you know, it's your family that's more important than being loved by you know, executives or strangers or whatever. So, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, actors are the worst. Actors, I'm, I can say that because I, I consider myself an actor. We're the worst. We're the most needy of all the show business animals, needy show business animals. Actors are the neediest. And they want to be loved. And their job, day after day, is to audition for people who say, no, thank you. Like, really, work hard, get dressed in a dumb costume as a cowboy, <laughs> humiliate yourself to get a job, and then people say no. Day after day after day, year after year after year, no. Even the most successful actors are told no. Matthew McConaughey, where's one of the guys, he wants to do a movie and someone out there is saying no to him. And they, he, at the top of his game, people are saying no. So you just, there's rejection everywhere you look. So ultimately, you have to figure out, well, why do, you know, I, I guess acceptance really isn't the reason. And you sort of invest yourself in creativity. In, in creativity and in a kind of strength training. I mean, you're proving yourself over and over and over again. <laughs> I think anyone who looks at me can tell I'm very disciplined. Well, <laughs> so, like, emotional yeah. strength. Yeah. Oh, OK. But yeah. I'm really interested in something, because you said you still consider yourself an actor. Yeah. So you've had this spectacular career as, as a writer and a producer and a director, and you still consider yourself an actor. Yes. Are you acting? Anytime anybody asks me to, I do. I do the Groundlings, Cooking with Gas. I do uh, parts in t people's TV shows. I do voiceover. I'll do any. I have no shame. And I will show up. I will wear my own clothes. The part is you crawl through a mile of dung, and you get to the end of it, and you get kicked in the face. What time, do, what can, what time can I show up? Excellent. It's fine. I'll be there. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely an actor. I was, because that is the thing that it's fun. It's fun. It's fun. Cool. Writing's fun too. Okay. Acting's fun too. I am a director now. I direct. That's fun too. Um, you know, I've, my, I've had musical. I've, I've written music. That's fun. You know, it's like it's all. That's that. That creative part is all really fun. Looking for that expression. Never done Insta Play Bill, but other than that, my career is complete. Come to workshop. <laughs> we tomorrow. talked about it. We talked. Come I might. Workshop tomorrow. Okay, perfect. Good. Okay, we got that worked out. Okay. Um, uh, so I used to do lights for Insta Play. That's right. So that was fun. That was really good. That Insta Play is our improv show in uh, in LA. Mm -hmm. Do you, as a television writer, have feel a sense of social obligation or responsibility, knowing that how many hundreds, thousands, or millions of ears are going to be listening to your words? Do you do you think with great power comes great responsibility? Sometimes. I mean, there are certain things I don't want to offend a class of people. You know, I don't want to offend people. I don't want to uh, needlessly offend them. Uh, I, I don't want to, you know, for kids shows, I'm, I work on kids shows now, we, we don't want to show somebody jumping off a roof or setting something on fire in case a four-year-old thinks, that was funny, I'm going to do that. And then he jumps off a roof and sets himself on fire. That would be, so for kids, I have, we have that kind of responsibility. For adults, uh, less so. For adults, I just want to sort of make sure that we're riding with the mindset of some kind of integrity, we're telling a story that has meaning, that has some something worth saying, mm -hmm. some truth in it that, for us, not like a, a, a moral or a message, but just like the theme of it makes sense. It's part of my life. It's, it, it really rings true. That's all. I don't, I don't need a lesson. I just need it to ring true. But is, is, that, is that the philosophy major coming back? I think it's just good writer, right? I mean, okay. all writing, all good writing is that. If you love something, you see some truth in it. Okay. I don't care what it is. If it's the X Men or if it's if it's uh, Interstellar or whatever people like, I, they're, they're, I don't. Do people like Interstellar? I don't know. Is it good? I've seen it yet? Yeah. Okay. So do so, you like it? Are so we they must see it this weekend. There must be something good in it, right? People like it. So it's it's there's truth in it. There's some truth in it you can relate to. What is the the Simpsons today versus the Simpsons at the beginning when you were working on it? The first hundred. <laughs> the the biggest difference is. Um, we were new and we were fresh and we, everything we do we did was new. Everything they do now is old. So they, they can't, there's not a story they can do that hasn't been done before in The Simpsons. They've done a 700 episodes. <laughs> it's like, it's crazy. Have but, they done that many? Yeah, and when I was wow. there, I was there not 
too recently, like a few years ago. I've told this story before. And I walked into the writer's room. To, sometimes you go back and you visit writer's room if I, have a, if I have a show you've left, if you have friends there. So I went to visit the writer's room. And it's weird because I left there 20 years ago. <laughs> and the same people are there sitting in the same chairs, but they're 20 years older. So you kind of freak out. It's like going to a bad high school reunion. Um, <laughs> And I said, well, what, what story are you doing? And they said, we're doing a Batman story. I said, didn't you already do a Batman story? I said, we've done eight Batman stories. <laughs> so, they, but they're doing, they're, they're another Batman story because it's, they're trying a new take on Batman. So they just have to keep finding new areas to mine and it's really hard. I right. think it's really, really hard to do that. I, I, I don't envy them trying to, trying to be fresh and then getting nothing but feedback from everybody saying, ugh, the Simpsons is so old now. It's hard. It's a hard, it's a hard business to be in. Taking, ripping stories from the headlines rather than creating them. What, it makes shows? it feel new, right? I mean, it's, it's happening right now. It feels current and of the moment, and it doesn't feel like your eighth Batman episode. So, I mean, that's, that makes sense. South Park does it better than The Simpsons can do it because South Park, it takes a week for them to make a South Park episode. They, re they literally do it in a week. It used to take us nine months to do one episode of The Simpsons. So they had our production schedule beat by a lot. Uh, so they could do something immediately. Uh, I think The Simpsons can do it a little faster than nine months now, but not much. Maybe four months or five months. So it's not, they're not going to do anything particularly fresh. I, when I was growing up, my dad used to write for something called Mad Magazine. Anybody know about Mad Magazine? So they, they do parodies of movies and stuff like that. But they're always, their parodies are always like a year old. It's always like way, like the movie has come and gone and been on cable and gone and then the parody shows up. And it's because of their production schedule. And so like, you know, they, it's hard to stay relevant and current when you're Mad Magazine. It's hard to stay relevant and current when you're The Simpsons. Yeah, the, the, the news cycle spins a lot more quickly. Yeah, it takes a long time to print it and ship it and all that stuff. I w just, just one quick thing. I'm really excited about School of Rock. You just started on it this week. Yes. So school, do we know the movie School of Rock, Jack Black? Yeah, it's going to okay. be a TV series on right. Nick. Isn't that great? It is. But it, yeah, it's, it's uh, well, obviously don't have Jack Black. That might hurt. I know, and that's tough. When you say, <laughs> when you say School of Rock, you say right. Jack Black. Exactly. And, and so we'll see. We're, we're just starting the process, so we'll see what it is, it's like. So will, will you be sure? That's a real kid show. Like, in other words, the other shows I wrote with, for adults, this is actually going to be for 6 to 11-year-olds. Everybody's clear about that. And will you be shooting that in front of a live studio audience? We may not be. I, I, we're going to have a three-day shoot. It's going to be multi-camera, but shows like iCarly were not shot in front of a live audience. They were shot block and shoot. Okay. And depending upon the acting talent we have, Got it. whether they're fresh and whether they're how experienced they are. If they're unex if they're not very experienced, there'll be no audience. They're Got just going to block and shoot and try to get readings the best they can. And if they're very experienced, maybe there's an audience. If they are super experienced and they're really good and you have studio audiences, Will you let me know so I can put it on our Facebook page and we can bring some sure. big laughers and warm bodies down to uh, enjoy a live Can you people TV? laugh like kids? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, that was You're good. That? that was good. <laughs> that was good. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please help me thank Jake Hogan. Good job. Thank you.